Hello and welcome to episode number five of Blueprint, our EOS Responsible Manufacturing vlog. My name is Björn, I run the sustainability department at EOS and I'm proud to be the host of this show. We've all heard repeatedly that climate targets cannot be achieved without intensive research and innovation. And at EOS we have significantly advanced industrial 3D printing over the past bit more than 30 years. We can really say that innovation is in our DNA. And that's why this episode is all about sustainable innovation. We're here, as you can see, in our R&D department, and I'm more than happy to have my dear colleagues with me, Marco and Marcus. So welcome, you both. And before we dive into the topic, may I ask you, Marco, to just shortly introduce yourself and your role at EOS. Sure, so thank you, Bern, for having us in here in our innovation lab. My name is Marco and I have two fantastic jobs at EOS. One is I'm leading innovation, so all the things which start with a crazy idea and end with a minimum viable product. And my second role is I'm responsible for the business unit systems. So we are designing and creating the fantastic 3D printers we have in our portfolio. Thank you, Marco. And Marcus, may I also ask you to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thank you for the invitation, Björn. I'm a system developer at the EOS Innovation Management Department and as a system developer, yeah, my job is so to say to further develop our 3D printing systems. And in my case, specifically the DMLS systems. And as a system developer, you have a quite broad area of activity, for example, ranging from engineering to software to testing, but also staying in touch with other departments and also connecting with customers. Essentially, everything that's needed to make new technology work uh, with our 3D printers. Okay, that sounds really interesting, like an interesting job description of you both, I have to say. Um, we all, all know electromobility, uh, green hydrogen, uh, meat out of, the, out of a lab. Yeah, those are mentioned to be the building blocks to fight the climate crisis. Uh, do you think that innovation in general can help uh, get us closer to carbon neutrality? Well, I'm not quite sure if these building blocks are really decisive on the climate crisis. The underlying problem, I think, is the overall resource usage and, despite the current situation, even further rising resource usage of humanity in general. But I think innovation can, can play a big role in making the, the resources we use more efficient. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's your take on this, uh, Marco? Do you agree? Well, I'm, I'm with Marcus, uh, of course. I would even strengthen the message a little bit in that direction that we really need to have focused innovations in order to solve the climate crisis we currently have and, and to make our planet uh, green again and uh, so these responsible innovations are quite important and, and we as EOS we are really very passionate about developing all these new things in order to to do our best uh, to to be responsible and and to to save our planet and what do you think i mean what specific levers innovation levers uh, do we have to make uh, uh, yeah, to make it more responsible? Well, first of all, I think 3D printing itself is already a lever because compared to other technologies, I really believe and I know that, that we are already quite responsible. But within 3D printing, I also see a couple of things we can do. It starts with uh, the materials we use. It starts with the machines uh, we design. Uh, what materials do we use in order to build these uh, machines? But the main lever, to my point of view, is the process of 3D printing itself. So how do we 3D print? And one key topic in metal 3D printing is exactly 
how efficient do we use the laser beam in the uh, metal powder in order to build parts. So this is, this is for us a key where we see also in the future some good points where we can improve and make our technology even more responsible as we uh, can do today. And that's also the reason why uh, Markus is with us today, because he is responsible for a very interesting and very important uh, project in, in our house, so which is called beam shaping. And beam shaping in, in high level description is we, sh we take the laser beam, we shape it, and with the newly created shape of the beam, we have a much more efficient and much better process as we have with a classical beam. But Markus can say much more to that uh, as I can do. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, so, so glad to get more information on this one. Can you explain a bit more in detail the technical details of beam shaping? Mm -hmm. So technically beam shaping means that we can change this state-of-the-art Gaussian power distribution within our laser beam to nearly any arbitrary other power distribution that we want. And by that we can also create different temperature distributions in, in the 3D printing process. And now different applications, different geometries, different materials um, have like an optimum way that they want to be processed. And now put more simply with beam shaping, we have like an AM toolbox of different laser beams, um, which work best for specific applications and material. So instead of using a one fits all uh, laser beam tool, so to say, we have a very broad and optimized toolbox. Mm, okay, that sounds very interesting, but also very technical. So what's the, what is actually the use case behind it? Mm -hmm. So to understand the use case behind beam shaping, we have to t take a quite deep look at the 3D printing process itself. So I've brought the slides here with me today um, to show you, to explain it a little bit easier. So if you were to point the machine's laser at, for example, this white sheet of paper, you would see a laser spot like this. Now, if we, if we cut this laser spot in half and plotted the, the profile of it, you would see this Gaussian distribution. And what we see in this, in this diagram is the brightness level of the power distribution um, over the spatial position within the laser beam. And now at specific brightness levels, there are different things happening in the direct metal sintering process. So for example, at this brightness level here, you have this melting threshold, which means the material on the powder starts to melt, forming a yeah, 3D printed track if you scan the laser over the powder. And this width of the track essentially means, essentially describes the productivity of the process. If you were to place many of these printed lines next to each other, you would get a layer and so forth. And at some point you will get a final part. Now, within the power distribution, there are higher brightness levels and they may exceed, for example, this evaporation threshold. So all the energy above this line is pretty much evaporated and vaporized into, into yeah, vapor. You can think about it like boiling water where you just put energy and even more energy into it, it just boils more violently, more violently but the temperature doesn't rise above uh, 100 degrees Celsius. And the same happens with the AM process. So essentially all that energy at the top here is lost into the air. And with the AM process, this also causes some nasty side effects like spatter generation. And it's also the reason why we know the uh, 3D printing process, um, yeah, to look as sparky as it does. Now with beam shaping, we can, for example, change this distribution to a flat top. And we can instantly see that with a flat top uh, profile, we are below this evaporation threshold. So there's no more evaporation, no more spatters. And at the same time, all the power that was in this peak before can be redistributed to the sides, which yeah, allows for a wider molten track and essentially means higher productivity. And that's the secret and idea behind beam shaping, making the process more efficient. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that uh, explanation. Uh, very well prepared, uh, I have to say. Thank you. Uh, so what interests me now, of course, is what is the contribution or what can be 
the contribution of beam shaping towards responsible manufacturing? Mm -hmm. So as I said, we're using the lasers energy more efficient. And according to our current uh, test results, we see that we can, for example, reduce material that would otherwise be lost in form of vapor and spatters, uh, can be reduced by 70%. At the same time, we can increase the productivity by a little bit more over 60%. And all of this while keeping the material properties, for example, the part density constant. And this higher productivity also has some nice secondary effects. Um, so having a shorter build time also means that the resource usage of auxiliary, auxiliary um, systems, for example, the, the cooling of the machine, the smoke filtration, and also the inert gas usage uh, goes down. So this, these are some secondary effects which contribute to a more sustainable production. Okay, that's really good to hear. Uh, uh, so thanks for working on that, actually, also from my side. Are there any additional benefits for, for customers? Um, so, yeah, despite uh, uh, using uh, less resources, uh, which also obviously also saves money, um, we're thinking about in the future if we can use this um, full control over the laser beam or essentially the, the melt pool thermodynamics of the process. If you can use this control to um, process materials which, which, are currently, which can currently not be processed, so so-called hard to weld materials. And these are quite often requested by our customers and we think with beam shaping we can enable some of these materials. Mm -hmm. So you said it's requested by customers, but is this already a product or is it still in a yeah, innovation and R&D phase? Mm. So it's not yet a product. Uh, it's still, the technology is still quite experimental. Um, but we work very closely together with universities and also selected customers. Um, also in an EU funded project called InShape. Um, yeah, to prove this technology and to find out how a final product might look like in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very interesting. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Marcus. Maybe a question to you, Marco. We heard a lot about innovation, different innovations, and of course, the, I mean, we're not doing it for the sake of innovation, but because uh, we want to, yeah, to answer a certain customer demand or support our customers. So, in general, how do innovations turn into products? Mm -hmm. Well, our innovation process is very clear here. Normally, we start with an idea and excellent people like Marcus start working on a topic and do some first steps and if we figure out this is somehow promising we already start talking to customers so we want to have a very very early buy-in of selected customers and uh, the next step is then that we do a cooperation project uh, with customers where we really get feedback from the field if this is working good and if it turns out that at the selected customers uh, the result is good, then we hand over uh, the idea, the concept to the uh, product development and we create a serious product out of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Do you have one or two examples of such uh, projects? Yeah, one example is standing directly in front of us. This is also a beam shaping example built on an M300 uh, system here uh, in-house. So Marcus and his colleagues worked on that. That's uh, a real part of a customer. I can't tell too much about this part. It's a kind of uh, clamping device. Uh, the interesting thing is here with this part, we already shown what Marcus explained that uh, a productivity increase of beyond 60%. So this was something we did, did together with the customer. And now the customer, of course, uh, you can imagine, is very keen in or, uh, to get this as a serious product. And now we are working together with, with uh, the business units uh, to realize that as a serious product. And one project which is even a little bit uh, uh, further than this one is something which we are also very proud of. So here in our innovation uh, lab, we developed a technology we call internally support-free building, which uh, aims to reduce uh, the number of supports in 3D printing uh, as much as possible. And 
again, we started with an idea, minimum viable product. We tested that. We figured out it's interesting. We had some first innovation cooperations with customers. And uh, these also went very well. And then we said, okay, now the next step is that we talk with the colleagues from Additive Minds. So uh, these are uh, consultant uh, colleagues within EOS, which work very closely together with customers. And a very good colleague of us, uh, Davy, he took the innovation and now is working very closely with, with uh, selected customers on this innovation. And the series release is very, uh, very close already. So we are planning that for the next uh, months. So this is how we really create this seamlessly idea to serious product uh, chain in the, in the EOS environment. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks a lot. So valuable uh, insights, I think, and interesting topic. So I think I will check out if Davy has some time for me uh, sometime soon or maybe today to get a bit more insights into support free. That's a good uh, idea. Topics. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll check that out. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Marco and Marcus, for providing your insights and sharing your knowledge and expertise uh, with us. Um, that was really interesting, uh, I have to say. And uh, we don't let you go without handing out our responsible manufacturing T-shirts. And I might show that into the camera if you allow. That's our little hummingbird. Uh, we have here, so one for you. And uh, also, we have our 3D printed hummingbirds, our symbol for responsible manufacturing uh, at AOS. And while you try, if the t shirt is your size, I will go get uh, Davy. Thank yeah? you very much. Thank you very much. See you next time. Davy. Hey Bjorn. Hi, good to see you. Likewise. Thanks for your time and being so spontaneous to be with us here. My pleasure. Uh, I just talked uh, with Marco and Marcus, our colleagues, about innovations uh, in, in the terms of sustainability. And they told me about a very interesting project uh, you're leading with regards to metal additive manufacturing without support structures. Uh, so it's great to have you here. My pleasure again. But before we dive into that topic, can you please shortly introduce yourself and your role at AOS? Of course. Um, so I'm Dave Ray, and I'm responsible for the Additive Minds Consulting Department. And basically what we do in Additive Minds, uh, which is a brand of EOS, is we are helping the customers to use the technology to the fully, fullest extent. So whether that is now through like uh, trainings or consulting projects or benchmarking, um, we are helping customers throughout their whole AM journey. And a typical AM journey goes from um, defining the strategy together with the customer, so the AM strategy, uh, developing the business case together with them, uh, developing their applications, of course, uh, including post-processing, process optimization, and so on, all the way to qualifying and scaling their production. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you, maybe as an introduction, can you explain uh, what are support structures and what are they needed for? Absolutely. To answer that question, I'll explain, of course, on a very high level, uh, how the additive manufacturing process works in metal. And so basically what we're doing is we deposit a layer, layer of metal powder, and then we are very locally going to heat up that powder with a laser. And so we create a melt pool, and then, of course, that material solidifies. And so since we're very locally heating that uh, material up, we have to also transfer that heat away from the melt pool so that it can solidify. And so one of the first um, reasons for, for supports is to like, take that heat and transfer it away mm -hmm. from the melt pool. Secondly, is, um, the reason is since we're very locally heating up the part and cooling things down, you create thermal stresses throughout the part. And so that means basically that uh, your stress, that you have stresses in your part and then um, they, they can lead to deformations and supports can help you to prevent those deformations. Thirdly is um, we have a recoder all the time going over our, um, 
our powder bed to yeah to deposit that that powder, and um, yeah the that recoder exerts some forces on the part and supports to make sure that like those features which you're building remain on the correct position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that what we see here, that would be a support structure there. Exactly, okay. like that one here mm -hmm. and a couple of others. Okay, okay. And does every metal part need support structures? Uh, no, it depends on, on a lot of factors. Uh, mm -hmm. So it depends of course on the application, the geometry, um, it depends on the material as well. And actually a lot of like design rules uh, within AM are exactly there to, to try and avoid uh, having supports, uh, which of course is, is waste material. Mm -hmm. And so how is AOS, how is Additive Mind supporting our customers to reduce support structures? Um, so um, it's, we have many reasons why we have support structures. And so that means also we don't have like one solution fits all. Mm -hmm. We have divided up our support-free strategy in three pillars. First pillar being everything around uh, plug-and-play solutions. So we are developing processes in order to uh, reduce the amount of supports we need. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, we have these processes are open, and so we have the software tools and features and, and also hardware solutions to uh, basically allow the customer to, to tweak those processes in order to meet their specific requirements. So whether it's um, improving the surface quality, reducing the build time, you name it, uh, we have the software tools uh, in order to, to make that possible. Of course, having tools alone is, is not enough. You need knowledge. And that's where Additive Minds comes in. So we provide like e-learnings on how to use those tools best. We do customer projects together with our customers to develop their support-free applications. And um, you know, they both provide a solution as well as uh, the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So maybe the most important question for me now is how does this contribute to a more responsible or a more sustainable production? Yes, of course. Uh, and the beauty of support free that, that it's a win-win uh, combination. I'll explain a little bit more. Um, so of course, if you don't have supports, you are not wasting that material because in the end, supports uh, are only there to facilitate the, the manufacturing process. Uh, and so therefore, not having to print support means you save material, mm -hmm. which is one of the biggest contributors to the uh, carbon footprint uh, of, a, of a part. Secondly, you're also saving time. Mm -hmm. So of course, since you not have to scan those supports, you also um, yeah, save that time, which, which you would have used. And therefore, um, you're saving things like energy consumption, uh, gas, uh, gas consumption, and so on, which also have an impact on your uh, sustainability. Thirdly, uh, which is sometimes forgotten, is you have to afterwards remove those supports mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well. And so, of course, that can be done by like some hand tools or some CNC uh, machining. And of course, all of these uh, post-processing steps also have uh, an impact on your carbon footprint. But like I said, it's a win-win. So we are saving all on the sustainability front, but we're also saving time and money because material and time costs cost money. And uh, you know we're not, we're not paying, let's say, for the sustainability aspect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's really good to hear. So happy that we are making progress in that area. Are there any additional, any further benefits uh, for our customers with regards to support free? Yeah, absolutely. So so far, I've been talking mainly about like the manufacturing process and, and the impact on on uh, sustainability. But of course, you know, all of our applications they have they have a certain purpose. And so with support for you, we're opening up, let's say, the, the classic design rules for AM. Mm -hmm. um, and we can build like, you know, overhangs, which are very shallow. And so that means we have much more design freedom, uh, which then opens up two things, either new applications, uh, which were not uh, possible before, and they're, in their use, they can be then, let's say, uh, more carbon neutral, or, um, the existing applications can be more performance. So for example, this is a bracket. Uh, we can produce it thanks to the support free, a lot more lightweight. And therefore, uh, you know, you're saving, for example, if it's a bracket for aerospace, you're, you're saving in fuel consumption then mm -hmm. of that airplane. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is this something our customers can already get? Is it a product already? Uh, yes, so everything I've mentioned so far, um, is a, a product available uh, to our customers. That doesn't mean you know, that, we, that we stopped innovating here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this, this part which we have in front of us is actually an example of a part 
which is made with uh, what we call the feedback loop, uh, which is the next step in our uh, support fee um, optimization. Specifically for, for this part, for example, we have reduced the amount of supports uh, by 80% and also reduced the build time by 40% and therefore, of course, have a huge impact on, uh, on the carbon footprint. Uh, how have we done this? Is basically we have used uh, a feedback loop. And mm -hmm. a feedback loop, basically, it looks all the time at our process and identifies you know, where is the material overheating and where normally the support takes that heat away no, we don't have that support there, but we're adapting the process on the fly in order to avoid overheating. And therefore, of course, you have less supports. Um, this is, however, is not a product which is already commercially available to our customers. It will be available in 2023 in May. However, uh, right now, our customers can already uh, get a taste of, of, um, of this product by basically coming to Additive Minds and, you know, challenging us with one of the applications and we can then um, together with them like develop let's say a support free part and then they can give us feedback you know does it work well what they, would they like to improve so that we can do basically or improve this innovation together with our customers mm. so that in the end of the innovation we have the best solution for our customers. Perfect. That sounds really uh, fascinating. Thank you very much, Davy, for providing these uh, interesting insights into, my pleasure. into this topic. So for now, all my questions are answered. Uh, but if you have more questions regarding innovation, regarding sustainability and 3D printing, just comment here below or send me a note on LinkedIn. And we won't let you go uh, before uh, I handed out my or our little T-shirt with a hummingbird. Super. Thank so you very much. So that's for you. Thanks. And of course, also the 3D printed bird. Ah, thank you so much. It's beautiful. Thank you. My pleasure.